You know, every year, no matter what kind of reading cycle we're in, every year the story for the Sunday after Easter is the story of Thomas. It's the same gospel every year. And maybe they figure it's because it's a, it's a lower Sunday in attendance, so like once out of every five years, everybody gets it. Maybe that's the story. But it's always this story of Thomas, and it's where we get the phrase doubting Thomas from. It's this story. So I want to spend a little time today talking about doubt. And there is some great, uh, some great guidance in this story of how to, uh, how to act when we're doubting, when others are doubting, and how to talk to those who may be doubting. And so uh, first I want to say two things about doubt. One, um, doubt isn't a sin. Doubt is just part of human life and growth. Um, we all have moments of doubt. There's that, that's just part of being human. Like temptation isn't a sin. It's part of being human. Doubt isn't a sin. We're all going to have moments of doubt. Uh, doubt serves a purpose. Just like temptation serves a purpose, doubt serves a purpose. Doubt is meant to help us dig deeper, ask uh, maybe harder questions than we initially wanted to ask, and it's supposed to help us kind of grow stronger roots in our faith. Doubt serves that purpose. And so... Uh, I want to I want to say we're going to talk about doubt today, and I'm going to assume all of us have had moments of doubt, and that's not calling anybody uh, calling anybody out for being a doubter. We've all had moments of doubt in our faith. It's human, it's part of being human. Uh, the second thing is there's a difference between being someone who's doubting at this current moment and someone who's trying to disprove. We've all sat down with people who um, who are trying to be a disprover. That's a that's a very different animal. Right? Doubt is, I'm struggling, I'm not sure what, what to think here. Disproving is what you think is wrong. Right? That's, a, that's a different, that's somebody who tries to kind of attack or criticize what another person believes. A doubt is, doubt, struggling with doubt is just us trying to figure out what we believe. We're asking questions about why we believe what we believe. So I'm not talking about a disprover. Disprovers, you know, can be pretty annoying. Uh, in most things, right? If you've ever been around like a vegetarian who's, a, no, no offense to any vegetarian here, but who's like the person that tells you every meal why eating meat is bad for you, they have to tell you that. Like that's like a disprover, right? They're, they're trying to convince you, persuade you, tell you why what you're doing is wrong. Like that's, that's not what we're talking about. We're just talking about when we struggle uh, maybe with our own faith sometimes and we ask questions and wonder why. And so in this story, there's three great uh, questions that get answered. And the first is, what should we do when we find ourselves doubting? When we find ourselves doubting. Um, be like Thomas. Thomas is a great example of what to do when we doubt. Because Thomas, here, here's what maybe we don't realize at first. This story that we read today takes, a, takes place between two Sundays. Just like uh, last Sunday was Easter, this Sunday is seven days later. The first time Jesus came to see the disciples was the night of Easter. That's when they all saw him but Thomas. Thomas waits a week until he comes back. He comes to seven days. He lets this go or before they see him again. So, so there isn't uh, an immediate resolution. And if you think about all that happens in a week, the conversation. Thomas is not going to believe because he didn't see it. The disciples believe because they did see it. But yet, they still stay together during the week. There's something beautiful about Thomas doesn't feel excluded from the group. He's allowed to wrestle with his doubt. And the group doesn't, doesn't kick him out. We'll talk about that more in a second. And they stay together. Now, I think the worst thing when we're experiencing doubt, the worst thing we should do is cut ourselves off from people who believe and just go to Google. Generally, not good advice. Like any medical people will tell you in here, the worst thing you can do when you're experiencing like pain is just not talk to another human, just go to Google, right? It's the same idea. Like the worst thing we can do when we're starting to doubt is say, okay, well, I'm not gonna talk to anybody at church. I'm not gonna go to church. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do, I'm just gonna go to Google and figure it out, right? I'm gonna look on TikTok and see what, see what I can find. Uh, not great advice. Thomas stays as part of the community, right? He stays, we could say he stays as part of the church. 
he stays as part of the disciples, the group of disciples, like they have relationships. Like Thomas's doubt isn't going to end their relationships. They're still together. And that's the beautiful thing about um, our kind of church, an Episcopal church. It's a beautiful thing about St. Albans is that we don't expect everybody to be in the same place every single week. There are weeks when uh, one of us may come in here with a heavy heart and struggling with doubt. Right? That's okay. It's okay. The, the, church is, the, the church is here to be a place where we can walk in with doubt. And so Thomas did that. So if, you're, if you find yourself struggling with doubt, I would say be like Thomas. You know, stay a part of the body of believers. Don't cut yourself off. That doesn't help. And so the second question is, well, what do we do when someone we love or someone we know is, is experiencing a season of doubt? There's a great example here. Be like the disciples. They didn't kick Thomas out. They didn't tell him to go home. They didn't challenge him to a debate. They didn't fight. They didn't argue. Well, maybe they did those things during the week, but they did it in a way that family would. But they didn't, uh, they didn't tell him he had no place here. They didn't draw a line in the sand and say, you can't be a part of us if you're not willing to accept what we saw. They just kind of stayed together. They, they made room for him. They showed him kindness. They didn't judge him. You know, everybody, this is my experience, and I would say 90% of times when we wrestle with doubt, it's because the doubt is, is connected to some sort of pain. Thomas was in pain. He, he lost Jesus. And, and what that meant for losing a person he loves, but what it also meant for what his life was going to be like. And those of you that have lost spouses or lost people you love, you know that feeling. The thought of, I'm, I'm losing this person. But it's also forcing me to face a number of questions about what is my new life going to look like without this person. Thomas is wrestling with all of that. There's pain behind all that. And he's not ready to just say, oh yeah, it's all better now because it, these guys had at one night thought they saw something. Like, doubt is always... 90% of the time, connected with pain. I remember uh, one time I was at a coffee shop and I was wearing my collar. And so someone came up to me and decided they were going to talk about, you know, how much they thought religion was nonsense and God didn't exist and all that. And I thought, you know, you could have just kept walking, right? That's what I would have done, right? If I saw somebody that was wearing like a nurse's outfit, I wouldn't say, you know, I think hospitals are terrible and sit down at their table and explain Right? I would just keep walking, right? I would keep that. But this person said, no, I see, I see a minister here. I want to sit down and tell them all the things that are wrong with the church. Okay. And so for some reason, God gave me the ability to just stay there and listen and be kind and not judgmental. And it was just kind of like one kind of, you know, strain of thought after another, after another. There wasn't really like any cohesive. There wasn't any big thing. It was just kind of, well, I read this, and I saw this, and I couldn't figure out what the real issue was. And then finally, after about 30 minutes, I heard this. I said, if God was real, why did I lose my seven-year-old daughter? Okay. Now I got it. Now I see what the doubt's connected to. Most people who are struggling with some kind of doubt is attached to some kind of pain. The disciples showed Thomas kindness. You know, instead of, being, instead of being judgmental, instead of being critical, instead of drawing the line in the sand, I think it would be helpful, you know, when we know someone we love that's struggling with doubt, to, to be compassionate, to understand. There's probably some pain connected to that doubt. In my experience, it almost always is. Uh, so we could be like the disciples, make room, be kind, be compassionate. Don't judge, don't draw a line in the sand, make room. And, and understand that there's probably pain attached to the doubt. And then the third thing we can do is, well, how do we talk to people with doubt? How do we talk to people with doubt? And in this one, I would say we could be like Jesus. You know, Jesus comes in, and um, he doesn't yell at Thomas. He just shows Thomas his wounds, what he's been through. And the disciples the whole time are just saying what they've seen. And then Jesus shows him what he's been through. And Thomas 
finally is on board, right? Because he sees Jesus. It's hard to doubt when you see it. Uh, but the best thing we can do with people who are, who are doubting is not to try to answer every question or, or somehow have like these eight Bible verses memorized that are going to convince someone. It's just simply to kind of share what we know, our experience of God. Not, not um, again, not the memorized Bible verse, but, but why we hold it to be true or what it means to us, or what we've experienced, and why we hold what we hold. Um, the disciples shared their experience, and then Jesus came and showed Thomas, here are my wounds. Here's what I've been through. Are you going to believe? Well, obviously, in that case, that's a pretty persuasive uh, piece of evidence there. But the idea is the same. right? We're not going to be as persuasive as Jesus. None of us will. But the idea is we don't have to, like, come up with this speech. We just need to uh, share our experience, our, our faith. I, I remember uh, I'm getting a call from a parent one time, and uh, in my own family, this is, wasn't in the church, this is in my own family, uh, and they were like, my son, teenager, right? You know what teenagers are like. They're all, they all ask questions. Uh, my son has all these questions. And I want him to talk to an expert, right? He must have been desperate if he called me as the expert. Uh, I want him to talk to an expert on, on these things so he can get his questions answered. What I told him was, because I know this family, I said, your son isn't asking why, your son isn't asking for an expert to answer these questions. The son is asking his father why he believes. Right? That's a different thing. He's not looking for Wikipedia. He's saying, Dad, why does it matter to you? Right? And, and most of the time, that's the best we can do, but that's, that's really better than the information. And I know that father didn't feel comfortable. It, it, it was sad in my heart. That father didn't feel comfortable talking to his son about why it mattered to him. He wanted him to go, like, research and find the answers, right? Go to Google. Worst idea. Uh, sometimes the best thing we can do is just say why it matters to us, because that's what people are looking for. If, if a friend, if a loved one, if a child, if a sibling, if, if someone we love is struggling with doubt and they want to talk to us about it, they're not looking for all the right answers. They just maybe want to know why it means something to us, why we believe it, why we hold it, why we pray, why we make an effort to get up on Sunday and go. That's what they're looking for. So sharing our experience, how to talk to people who doubt, be like Jesus. I would imagine on any given week, we have um, people who are doubting, people who are loving someone or praying for someone in their family or in their friend group that might be doubting, or someone who's struggling with the words um, to figure out how to talk to someone who's doubting. And I think this story gives us three great examples. If we're doubting, be like Thomas. Stay in it. Stay in it. If we're struggling uh, with someone who doubts, be like the disciples and make room. Be kind. Be compassionate and make room. And if we're looking to how to talk to someone who's struggling with doubt, be like Jesus and just share what we've been through. Um, those are the three best things we can do if we're the doubter, if we're making room for the doubter, or if we're trying to talk to the one who doubts. At, at some point in our life, we're going to be all three. So the story is a great example of how to navigate those three points. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.